I always tell people the most valuable lesson I got from my mentor, Jim Rohn, was I asked my father worked two jobs. We were always broke. We had no money for food. And we lived in a community we moved to, which was, I thought they were all rich and we were on the other side of the tracks. It was a lower middle class, but compared to where we lived before, these people seemed rich compared to us. And I, I just didn't understand it. And Jim said to me, Tony, it's not about the value of your soul. It's about the value of you in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And your father's skills are not that valuable. He used to take, he was an underground parking attendant and he would take people's ticket and make change. Well, the research now shows it's being done at Yale, it's being done overseas in England as well, and they found that 40% of all jobs they project in the next 10 years are going to disappear because of technology. It's going to be replaced by an algorithm, it's going to be changed, you know, all these guys on Wall Street, you're seeing all these algorithms take over and they're getting rid of all these traders, right? It's changing radically these, in these hedge funds. There's three million truck drivers. Self-driving cars are here, in the next five years they will be the standard, certainly within seven or eight years. Are you going to hire someone who can only work eight hours a day and sometimes gets drunk or can make a mistake when you can buy a machine, write down the machine, and be in a position where it works 24 hours a day driving? But no one is telling these drivers this, and it's, they have to retool now. So technology is the biggest challenge. Labor is less valuable because of efficiencies with technology, and it's going to get better and better for technology, which is scary when you think about what's going to happen for jobs. So the, I say to people, you've got to participate in your own rescue. You've got to retool yourself. The idea that Bernie Sanders has of providing free education sounds wonderful, but the education he wants to do is community college. There are no skill sets in community colleges today, for the most part, that are going to prepare you for the economy or a job that's there. So what is that going to do? You're just going to waste more money, more time. We need to retool ourselves. The government's not going to do it for you. If you look at a business, the chokehold on the growth of any business is always the psychology and the skill set of the leader. And it's 80% psychology and 20% mechanics. Meaning, so many small businesses, you know, um, the, the owner might be an incredible innovator. Maybe they write incredible code. Maybe they're a tremendous influencer. But they don't know the economic side of their business, right? And they find themselves getting in trouble because somebody's giving them financial information after the fact. They don't have true financial intelligence to make decisions, and can, they get caught up. Can you can you give me an example of a, of a business like that? You don't have to name names. Yeah, no. I, God, there's, I, I'll pick my own examples. I had several companies early in my career that were near bankruptcy because I would sit down and I would I knew how to produce products that would change people's lives. I knew how to market. I knew how to build teams of people. But what I didn't know was finance. So I'd look and say, you know, okay, what, how are we doing? I go, oh, you got a great, you know, you got a 20% profit. You know, you got $2 million in profit in those days, a little tiny company. And I come to the end of the year, there was no cash, right? I didn't know that profit is a theory, right? You know? And so just not having that skill, or someone might be really great in finance, but they're not any good in marketing. So sometimes it's a skill problem, but 80% of it, you can solve those skills. You can get those skills if you can change your psychology. But when you accept that, oh my God, the market's down, or oh my God, the economy in our area is down, when you allow the environment to control your psychology, you're not gonna win. I'd say the number one common threat of anybody that I work with is successful. Financial, athletes, people in politics, it's hunger. You know, you and I both know intelligence is a pretty valuable tool, but there are a lot of very smart people who can't fight their way out of a paper bag. And then when you find somebody who has that hunger, the hunger that doesn't go away, that hunger to be more, to do more, to give more, that hunger that never ends, um, you know, that's how you get these people that are the best in the world at whatever they do. And so if you can, I think everybody has that hunger, but for some people, it's been asleep for a long time because they're afraid. They're afraid that I'm gonna get hungry, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna fail. And so it, it's human nature to protect yourself from the fear by just lowering your expectations. But one of the things I've learned is you get what you tolerate. You get what you tolerate in yourself, you get what you tolerate in your life, and sooner or later, we sometimes hit a point where we say, not another day, not another hour, this is done. I'm not walking this way, I'm not talking this way, I'm not living this way, I'm not gonna be in this relationship anymore, I'm gonna change it. And when people do that, that's the beginning of a breakthrough. Failure is part of life. I mean, uh, the difference for me, though, is I look at failure as a stepping stone to success. It's a, it's a speed bump. Uh, I know I'm gonna fail, um, but it's not failure if you learn something, and so, Gosh, I've, I've made so many mistakes. I've screwed so many things up. But every time I do, it just becomes it becomes a way for me to explain to someone else what it takes. You know, it's like, here's what I've done. I, I think I have the ability to influence people because I talk about my failures. I talk about all the things that mess me up. But I show people that I didn't let it stop me, and you don't need to stop you. And I think I think that's really the secret right. matter. And if everything you touch was successful, you First probably won't be able to relate to people as much. No, either. you'll be relate. And also, it's be total bullshit. Right, right. And everyone knows it's bullshit.
and also you'd be bored silly. I mean, think about it. If you just said, I want this to happen, I want this to happen, you know, people don't value what they don't fight for. You know, it's like you see kids sometimes, in a, you know, your parents will say, you're not going to value this if you don't work for it. And your kid going, I'll value it, just give it to me. Right? <laughs> but it's true. Yeah. You know, the things we've worked the hardest for, we value the most. So I think, you know, the purpose of a goal is not getting it anyway. The purpose of a goal, you know, is what, who you become. Who you become is going to make you happier. It's going to make you sad. Yeah. So um, I, I'm not looking for an effortless approach. Sure, sure, sure. There's no such thing. I believe in work-life integration. I don't think the... Um, uh, and I'm not being disrespectful because I. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I want to. That's what I'm saying. Everybody has a different metaphor. I'm telling you my metaphor. I'm not making somebody wrong who's focused on balance. But to me, if you say balance, it's like, okay, let's use a teeter totter or a seesaw. Okay, we're going to, let's balance it. Now, now that we've done that, how long are we going to stay in there balancing this thing before one of us wants to jerk this thing around just to feel alive, right? Yeah, yeah. So I really think balance is, is more about integration for me. It's more about, um, like, how do I make sure that I feel like the areas of my life, my wife, my children, my grandchildren, my health, sports, I got 31 companies, you got 1200 employees in seven radically different industries, we do 5 billion a year. I mean, it's so you know, all these things are going on. How do I do that? Well, I believe that the way I do that is in streaks. I do streaks of unbelievable intensity work and then I do streaks of like, let go and be in, you know, paradise and enjoy. And so I like running high. I want to. I want to at the end have me climb a new mountain. That's just me. So I'm not saying that's right for other people. I'm saying you got to find what it is. But the idea of balance for most people makes them torture themselves. And I say for me, if it tortures you, get rid of it. And instead of saying talk about integration, I asked uh, Mary Callahan Erdos, who's if you're not familiar with her, she's probably the one of, if not the smartest person in the financial world, female. She's uh, head of JP Morgan and manages 2.3 trillion with a T, not a B, trillion dollars of the money. One of the nicest human beings you'll ever meet, breaks all the molds on people in the financial business. There's not an ounce of manipulation in her body. I mean, just good, good soul. And I asked her about the balance thing. You're running the biggest bank in the world, right? Trillions of dollars. And she said, Tony, I don't believe in it. And she told me work life balance. I started laughing. We're completing each other's sentences. She has the same philosophy. But her dad used to take her to work. And he was a financial guy when she was a little girl. She used to have her brother be the secretary. <laughs> she took her dad's seat and ran the show. And she said, doing that with my dad, she goes, I loved it. I was a part of his life. I got to be a part of, see that part of his life instead of coming home and me not knowing it. And she said, that's what she's done with her kids. And at JP Morgan, she leaves and picks her kids up. And she still runs the biggest bank in the world and bills trillions of dollars. So would she say it's balanced? She'd say, no, it's not balanced, it's integrated. She knows when to move into one or the other, right? So that all the parts of her life are rich. Maybe instead of balance, it's a rich life in the areas that matter. Yeah. Right? Rich with your children, rich with your husband or wife, rich with your dear friends, rich with the impact that you want to have, your mission, rich in terms of successful business and or whatever your career is that you really feel a sense of meaning and enjoyment. To me, that's more important than balance. And I think, but I'm a very passionate, crazy son of a bitch. Right? So it's like, you know, balance sounds a little boring to me well, personally. No. If you're tortured by balance, trying to be balanced, like, oh, people, oh, I'm not balanced enough. Give that shit up. <laughs> Instead, enjoy yourself. Enjoy your children. Enjoy the time. Be where you are right now. That to me is more important than trying to make everything balanced because that becomes, that gets you cerebral. It makes you evaluate things. Yeah. The more you evaluate, the less you can actually experience what's here right now. Most entrepreneurs are artists in their nature. You know, I look at three types of personalities. An artist is somebody that has a tremendous gift, a skill, an ability, a talent. You know, like an athlete. Uh, you know, Curry is in, is in the NBA, is an incredible artist. Uh, some people, they're, they're artist sales, they can sell ice cream basketball. Well, some people, it's writing software, they're incredible, or designing clothes. And most businesses are started by an artist who says, I can do it better. But they don't realize that as you start to try to grow a business, uh, you're the most talented employee you have at the beginning and the cheapest one, right? Yeah. And now you have to hire other people, and you know they're not going to do as good a job and entice people into this negative effect. What I really see is the biggest mistake that these individuals make is they don't understand business. They get in because they want to do good work for their client. And most of them, as you know, 96% are gone in 10 years. And the 4% that survive, they aren't necessarily profitable. I mean, 5% of all businesses ever crack a million dollars gross, not net profitability, gross. 
and you have 0 .0006, so it's six one hundred six out of a hundred thousand businesses will ever do ten million gross. So it, it, I say to people in business, I never encourage people to get a business. I try to push them away <laughs> because it's too hard. If you don't have the internal drive to make it through that psychologically, you're better partnering with somebody. You're better doing something else. I think underestimating business is the challenge. And I always say that eighty percent of the chokehold on the growth of any business is always the owner, it's the leader, and 80% of that is their psychology, and 20% is skills. Like, if you don't know how to market, you're in trouble. Most most entrepreneurs get in trouble because they don't know how to read their financials. They don't have a clue. I didn't either. You know, it's like, you can go out on a plane on a day like today that's a decent day, and you can fly if you're a pilot with what they call visual flying rules. So you can look out around you and you can fly. If you get in a storm, you better be able to read those instruments or you're going to die. And most entrepreneurs know how to read those instruments. They look down and they see profit and loss and they go, oh, I made a profit or I made a loss and they have a beer either way. One to drown out the pain or the other one to celebrate, right? And profit is a theory, as you know. Accounting is a very special language. And unless you understand how to use accounting to make better decisions, until you learn to understand to measure things in a way that gives you better decision-making capability, then you get broadsided and, you know, Profitability, you get a lot of profit and no cash. So I think not understanding the full aspect of the business, not managing your own psychology, and not knowing your numbers would be three critical things that I think sabotage most businesses.